what, what I really want to try to uh, achieve here is to make Mars seem possible, uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes, um, and that you can go. And, and is there really a way that, that anyone could go if they wanted to? I think that's, that's really the important thing. Round trip times to Mars are on the order of years. And launch opportunities to Mars are only once every 22 months, which is a very significant logistics problem. And last, you're far enough away that you're not going to be able to do real-time communications with Earth. You're going to be limited by speed of light lag. You're certainly, the kids sitting here, probably some of the adults too, don't even think about playing Fortnite with somebody on Earth. That is not going to work. Most fundamentally, these other planetary surfaces do not have and cannot have Earth normal gravity. You're going to be stuck with whatever gravitational field they have. In the case of Mars, that's one third G. I mean, first of all, why go anywhere, right? Um, the, I, I think th there, there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, I, I don't have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but there's, it's eventually history suggests there will be some, some doomsday event. Uh, the alternative is to become a space-bearing civilization and a multi-planet species which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Yes? <laughs> so, instead, what O'Neill and his students came up with was the idea of manufactured worlds rotated to create artificial gravity with centrifugal force. These are very large structures, miles on end, and they hold a million people or more each. Here's the International Space Station for scale. This is a very different kind of space colony. Let's take a look at what they might look like inside. High-speed transport, agricultural areas. We added a little drone there. cities in the background. Some of them would be more recreational. They don't have to have the same gravity. You could have a recreational one that keeps zero G so that you can go flying with your own wings. Some would be national parks. These are really pleasant places to live. Some of these O'Neill colonies might choose to replicate Earth cities. They might pick historical cities and mimic them in some way. There'd be whole new kinds of architecture. These are very, these are ideal climates. These are shirt sleeve environments. This is Maui on its best day all year long. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. What does the architecture even look like when it no longer has its primary purpose of shelter? We'll find out. But these are beautiful. People are going to want to live here. And they can be close to Earth so that you can return, which is important because people are going to want to return to Earth. They're not going to want to leave Earth forever. They'll also be really easy to go between. The amount of energy required to go between these O'Neill colonies from one to another to visit friends, to visit family, to visit one that's a recreational area. Very, very low energy needs to transport and quickly. It's a day trip. So how do we figure out how to, how to take you to Mars um, and, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that um, is not merely an outpost but can become a planet in its own right um, and for us thus we could become a truly multi-planet species. Uh, th th there are, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why, why Mars? Um, 
Well, um, just to sort of put things into perspective, this is, this, is what, this is an actual scale of what the solar system looks like. So we're, we're currently in the, the third little rock from the left. Uh, that's Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, and, and our goal is to go to the fourth rock on the left. Uh, that's Mars. Um, but you can get a sense for the real scale of the solar system, how big the sun is, and Jupiter, um, Neptune, uh, you know, Saturn, Uranus, and then the little guys on, on the right are Pluto and friends. This, this sort of uh, helps see it not, not quite to scale, but it gives you a better sense for, for where things are. Uh, so our options for, for, going to, for, for becoming a multi-planet species within our solar system are, uh, are limited. Uh, we have, uh, in terms of nearby options, we've, we've got Venus, uh, but Venus is a high pressure, a su super high pressure, hot acid bath. Um, so that, that would be a tricky one. Uh, Venus is not at all like um, the, the, the goddess. This is not in no way similar to, to, to the actual goddess. Um, so uh, it really difficult to make things work on Venus. Uh, Mercury is also way too close to the sun. Um, we could go potentially on, the Mar one, of the, on the, one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much further from the sun, a lot harder to get to. It really leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planet civilization, and that's, that's Mars. Uh, we could conceivably go to our moon, um, and I certainly have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it's, it's challenging to create a, uh, a become multi-planetary on the moon because it's, it's much smaller than, than, than a planet. Uh, it doesn't have any atmosphere. It, it's not as resource rich as Mars. Um, it's got a 28 day day, whereas the Mars day is 24 and a half hours. Um, and it, in general, Mars is, is far better suited to ultimately scale up to be a self-sustaining civilization. And we have a gift. We were given a gift, this nearby body called the moon. We know a lot now about the moon that we didn't know back in the Apollo days, or even really just 20 years ago. One of the most important things we know about the moon today is that there's water there. It's in the form of ice. It's in the permanently shadowed craters on the poles of the moon. And water is an incredibly valuable resource. You can use electrolysis to break down water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you have propellants. Another great thing about the moon, another reason it's a gift, it's nearby. It's three days away. And you don't have uh, constraints on launch, the, the, the 22 months kind of thing that you have. With Mars, you can go to the moon just about any time you want. And of great importance for building large objects in space, the moon has six times less gravity than Earth. When you get resources from the moon, you can get them into free space at very low cost. It takes 24 times less energy to lift a pound off the moon than it does to lift a pound off the Earth. That is a huge lever. Mars, Mars is a fixer-upper of a planet. And um, so it's, it's going to take some work to make it, make it easy to live there. But one day we could make Mars a planet like Earth, and I think we should. So, uh, just some facts about Starship, and th these these numbers will evolve over time. Um, so, uh, the height of the ship is about 50 meters, 164 feet. Uh, the nine meter or th 30 foot uh, diameter. Well, you can just see it basically. Um, <laughs> um, it's got about 1,200 tons of, of propellant on the the ship and uh, thrust is about 1,500 tons. Um, now these numbers will, you know, will probably add more propellant over time, increase thrust. Um, diameter will, will stay the same. It's a huge, huge pain to change diameter. <laughs> so that, that'll tend to stay the same, but it'll probably get a little bit longer. And uh, we're expecting payload capacity of uh, 100 to 150 tons, depending on, on which orbit. Let me show you something.
This is Blue Moon. We've been working on this lander for three years. It's a very large lander. It'll soft land in precise way, 3.6 metric tons onto the lunar surface. The stretch tank variant of it will uh, soft land 6.5 metric tons onto the lunar surface. 